In this talk, I'll discuss Staph aureus infections and their diagnosis, treatment, and prevention. The by now familiar pathogen map showing that we're still in the upper left-hand corner talking about Staphylococci. And I want to review how Staph aureus infections are diagnosed, and then I want you to recognize the key cornerstones of successful Staph aureus therapy, that you must define the extent of a Staph aureus infection, pursue source control, and treat with an appropriate course of antibiotics. And lastly, we'll review briefly some methods of prevention of Staph aureus infections. When you send a clinical specimen to the microbiology lab, whether it's a sputum or a wound culture or a surgical specimen, Staph aureus may frequently be identified on the gram stain. The technologist will see gram-positive cocci and clusters but even if it's not seen on the initial gram stain, Staph aureus usually grows readily in standard culture media, such as blood auger, turning positive within the first 24 to 48 hours. Not always, but in most cases. The picture that you can see on this slide is of the disk diffusion testing method for antibiotic susceptibility. So on that plate is a lawn of Staph aureus, sort of the white or creamy color. And then the smaller white dots are antibiotic impregnated disks around which there's a zone of inhibition for most of them where Staph aureus is not growing. And depending on how large that zone of inhibition is, you can establish whether this particular isolate of Staph aureus is susceptible or resistant to the particular antibiotic in question or whether it's an, of intermediate susceptibility. You'll notice there's no zone of inhibition around the lower left one, uh, E for erythromycin. And the more interested among you may notice that uh, there's one zone of inhibition around clindamycin that's sort of D-shaped, and you could look up what the D-test for clindamycin resistance is in Staph aureus testing. I won't spend time on it here. And this is more traditional uh, culture and testing methods. Newer molecular techniques such as PCR, for example, for the MECA gene, are increasingly used both for rapid detection and identification of antibiotic resistance. So, for example, if a blood culture in the lab flags positive on an automated detection machine, then a technologist may remove that, look at a gram stain, see gram positive cocci and clusters from that blood culture, and may then move to do a PCR for the MECA gene to more rapidly establish whether this is Staph aureus, and if so, and does it have mesalin resistance. Once you've established that you have a Staph aureus infection, you'll need to think about the optimal treatment of that infection. There's no one-size-fits-all approach. It will depend on the site of the infection as well as how sick the patient is and, and possibly some other factors. But the key concepts, the big picture things that I want you to know are that anytime you have a Staph aureus infection, you first need to establish the extent of the infection. Remember, for example, with skin and soft tissue infections, Staph may cause an uncomplicated abscess or a, an infection of the superficial layers of the skin, or it can cause life-threatening, deep, necrotizing fasciitis. So based on your clinical history and your physical exam and possibly some imaging as well, you'll need to figure out exactly what anatomic space is infected, what is the extent of that infection. A second key big picture concept is that wherever there's pus, you want to drain it. So antibiotics, whether you take them orally or give them intravenously, have to be delivered to the site of infection via the bloodstream. A walled off abscess or a collection of pus has no blood supply going into it and may be poorly responsive to antibiotic therapy alone. So if there's a deep abscess, if there's an infection in a joint, then that should be drained to give antibiotics the optimum chance of curing the infection. And then a third big picture concept is that where there's infected hardware, whenever possible, if it's infected with Staph aureus, it should be removed. So that is true for intravenous catheters or for prosthetic valves, uh, for prosthetic joints or other arthroplasties. If you have infected hardware, Staph aureus will tend to form biofilms, very hard to eradicate with antibiotic therapy alone, and where possible, that hardware should be removed. That won't always be possible. For example, if you have a patient who has hardware in his spine, and if the hardware were removed, the spine would be unstable. That hardware may have to be in place, left in place, but that creates a, a very tricky uh, and difficult situation to adequately treat that infection. If possible, remove the hardware. The choice of the antibiotic that you use to treat a Staph aureus infection will hinge on whether 
it's a methicillin susceptible or MSSA infection or methicillin resistant MRSA infection. For MSSA, it's pretty clear that the beta-lactam agents are associated with better outcomes and are preferred. So for serious infections, you'll start with intravenous therapy and you would use for MSSA agents such as nafcillin, oxacillin, or cefazolin. For infections that are less serious, for example, an uncomplicated uh, skin infection, or for step-down therapy after an initial period of intravenous therapy, once the patient's getting well, you may want to switch to an oral therapy option. And for MSSA, those would include antibiotics like cephalexin, amoxicillin clavulanate, or dicloxacillin. Again, all of these antibiotics in this section are beta-lactams. For MRSA, the beta-lactams aren't an option with the exception of uh, a couple of the newer cephalosporins that you may see in your clinical practice. But in general, for MRSA, using the same approach, intravenous therapy for serious infections, the two mainstays here are vancomycin and possibly daptomycin. Uh, there are other antibiotics, um, but these are the two that you'll see most frequently. For oral therapy options, these include linazolid, clindamycin, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, or the tetracyclines. On this slide, I've listed a few types of Staph aureus infections and the uh, general concepts of their treatment. So for impetigo, an infection of the superficial dermis only, a topical antibiotic such as mupirocin may be adequate, and those patients uh, would not even require systemic therapy. The same may be true of uncomplicated skin abscesses. So incision and drainage for a patient who's not systemically well uh, may be all that's required, and those patients may not need antibiotics at all. Drain the pus. There's a local infection in the patient as well. That patient is likely to do well with or without antibiotic therapy. Contrast that with complicated skin infections where the patient is febrile or systemically ill. Those patients should receive antibiotics. For uncomplicated bacteremia, as previously defined, treatment here for this serious and life-threatening infection is all intravenous therapy and should be at least two weeks from the date of the first negative blood culture. So for MRSA, you would use vancomycin or daptomycin, the two agents that are FDA approved for this indication. For MSSA, you would use a beta-lactam, usually cefazolin or nafcillin or maybe oxacillin, depending on what your institutional preference is. For complicated bacteremia, patients who have a little bit worse prognosis, therapy should be longer, four to six weeks, and this is all intravenous therapy. For pneumonia, the optimal treatment duration is not well defined. Usually you would give between one and three weeks or seven and 21 days, depending on the severity of the infection as well as the response that the patient has to therapy. A patient who gets well more quickly might uh, receive a shorter course of therapy and someone who remains on the ventilator uh, or doesn't uh, do well with their initial pneumonia treatment uh, may get a longer course of therapy. And it's a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but uh, in the last example, I've talked about an infection of indwelling hardware if you can't remove the hardware or if you don't remove the hardware. So to, to continue with the example of the patient who had uh, Staph aureus bacteremia that led to infection of hardware in the spine, if that hardware can't be removed, then you would end up treating that patient with a course of intravenous therapy. And then at the end of that, in many cases, uh, would put patients on an oral suppressive antibiotic with the idea that that infection will be impossible to eradicate with the hardware left in place. And you're just trying to keep the infection suppressed indefinitely. There's plenty of gray area and different approaches in that situation. But uh, the, the larger point that I want you to take away is that curing infected hardware with, that has staph aureus uh, is a nearly impossible task without removing the hardware. Given how hard these infections are to treat and the morbidity and mortality associated with staph aureus infections, there's been an understandable emphasis on the prevention and control of these infections. There's some general me measures which are not specific to staph aureus, uh, but that will help decrease the incidence of staph aureus infections. These include antibiotic stewardship. Remember that shortly after the introduction of penicillin and then the introduction of methicillin, uh, resistance to those antibiotics developed in staph aureus. So in general, 
the fewer courses of antibiotics, the less selection pressure, pressure on the bacteria, the slower resistance will be to develop. This is true not just for Staph aureus, but for other infections as well. The big concept here is avoid unnecessary courses of antibiotics and give short courses of therapy when that's medically appropriate. A second general uh, concept is that you should remove or avoid placing in the first place any unnecessary prosthetic material. So a patient in the hospital who has a Foley catheter in the bladder and who doesn't need it anymore, that catheter should be removed before it gets infected, whether that's with Staph aureus or with another pathogen. Or if a patient doesn't need that central line anymore now that the patient's doing better, go ahead and remove that line and prevent the infection. And a third big picture general uh, reminder is that hand hygiene is important. Washing the hands before and after patient contact to avoid moving staph aureus from patient to patient or room to room. Now measures aimed specifically at MRSA or at staph aureus include contact precautions. So this is for patients who have been identified to have an MRSA infection for any patient contact using a gown, gloves, and meticulous attention to hand hygiene to prevent spread of that pathogen from room to room and patient to patient. Patients who are undergoing surgeries will also receive preoperative antibiotics, and these are aimed at Staph aureus, again, because Staph aureus is the most common surgical site infection. So patients just prior to the first incision will receive antibiotics uh, for many surgeries that are aimed at uh, prevention of Staph aureus surgical site infections. There's more controversy, as uh, noted by the question marks here, about whether it's wise or prudent to pursue active surveillance. So this means for any patient in a defined population, such as patients coming to your emergency department or patients admitted to your ICU, uh, should you swab all of their noses and see if they're colonized with MRSA? And if you do that, should you decolonize those patients, give them antibiotics uh, such as topical chlorhexidine or mupirocin to try to eradicate their skin or um, nose colonization with MRSA? Those policies are a bit more controversial as it, their efficacy is uh, not entirely clear. Some ICUs will also use a policy of universal decolonization with chlorhexidine, so essentially bathing the patients every day uh, with an antibiotic or a chlorhexidine uh, soap uh, to prevent colonization with drug-resistant pathogens that then might go on to cause infections.